Good evening, everyone. This is Brother Smith, Little Rock, Arkansas, Pastor First Gospel Church. Um, it's Thursday night at 7 p.m. And uh, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone else with us tonight again. It's been a rainy day, uh, nasty. <laughs> yesterday and today, but I think the sun's going to be out tomorrow, so uh, it'll be nicer, be a nicer day for all of us. Hope everyone's doing well. I uh, appreciate uh, the Lord, appreciate his hand on us and on his body, and uh, the kingdom of heaven is uh, alive and well. I do know that there's there's some that uh, got some prayer requests, to, you know, for still the church in uh, Humboldt, Texas, and uh, Wichita. Still, both churches still have a significant number of people with coronavirus. I haven't heard the latest on Sister uh, Sister Sherry. Uh, Sister Sherry's last name uh, in Houston. Anyway, um, we still need to pray for her. I hadn't got an update on her today, but I, I know she's still in the hospital, so keep remembering her. And Also, uh, I think Brother Mackey, Brother Bloom, and uh, trying to think else, oh, Brother Paul Golden in Wichita. Sister Sherry Riley, that's her name. Yes, thank you, Ann. Um, anyway, uh, we certainly want to keep these people in our prayers. Um, I know, uh, you know, winter's coming upon us, and so flu season. I read today where, uh, and I don't know, uh, any more than what I read, and they did not say this was absolute, but they did say that there was uh, evidence that those taking the flu shot, it will help them also uh, to not con contract uh, the COVID disease. And they gave the reason for it was is because, and they said this does happen with some vaccines, in some sicknesses, it's because uh, it boosts your immune system. And that's helping, they said. There's evidence, they said the evidence right now that, that's showing that a person is 39% less apt to uh, get COVID if they take the, the current flu shot. So we don't know, you know, I, I uh, <laughs> In, in this whole thing, you wonder who does know because they're, you know, it's the medical profession is still, and scientists are still trying to get it all figured out. But I appreciate everything that they're doing and I appreciate all the workers and laborers in that field because it's, you know, they're our lifeline as far as natural things are concerned. Our main hope and trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ, of course. <laughs> Um, I want to give you a, a teaching tonight on uh, a subject that I think is grossly misunderstood. It's not a great mystery, but I think it uh, is something that's pretty grossly misunderstood, uh, certainly in religion, uh, in Christianity, but also in the body of Christ. I noticed a lot of people... Um, um, you know, look at these scriptures and try to interpret them uh, with just the natural way it sounds. So I want to go to Matthew, uh, the 28th chapter and the 19th verse. Here Jesus is giving instructions to his 12 apostles. And uh, uh, Matthew 28 Verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Um, here it says to teach all nations. And, <clears throat> you know, there's some men that uh, are projecting that, you know, we need to teach. We need to, this, this gospel's go out, got to go out to the whole world. It does, in fact, uh, need to go out to the whole world that God, that the Gentile world that God's reaching out to. There is a harvest in the end of this world, just like there was a harvest in the end of the Jewish world. I'll give you a scripture where Jesus had said in St. John, he told his disciples, said, say not it's four months to the harvest. For he said, the, wheel, the fields are white and they're ready to harvest. And, you know, the, the disciples must have been greatly confused by that because it, it was uh, four months before really the natural harvest and the fields were not white, they were green. You know, if you look at a barley field, <clears throat> barley uh, matures faster than wheat. Barley comes uh, first and then the wheat comes on the, uh, the generally the wheat uh, ready to harvest by the time of, of Pentecost. And so um, when Jesus said that, I'm sure his, his disciples thought, what is he talking about? It's, it is four months to the harvest. But what he was talking about was is that there was a spiritual harvest right upon the end of that world. And it was right nearing uh, and being ready to harvest. And Jesus said, pray that there's laborers. For he said, the, the, the work, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And so <clears throat> there was a harvest in that world. And then in the end of this world, in Revelation, the 14th chapter, John saw one likened to the Son of Man on a cloud with a sickle in his hand. And a voice came out of the temple and said, thrust in your sickle for the earth is ripe and ready to harvest. And so there's a harvest coming in the end of this world. Once the church is restored, uh, the last prophetical hour, there will be a tremendous harvest of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a restored church that will accomplish making up the remainder of the bride. Uh, that that one hour, prophetical hour, 15 years, will, there's so many things that's going to happen in that length of time. The, uh, the image of the beast will be made and set up. The <clears throat> eighth head <clears throat> will come into power. Uh, <clears throat> God will gather all of his children that can be reached or those that will uh, respond to the harvest will come out of Babylon. Babylon, saints, is the, that word is a term for confusion and that word means, uh, I mean, it means confusion, but <clears throat> that is a conglomeration the beast system that's going to be set up and the mark of, of the image of the beast. Uh, those that take <clears throat> the, the mark of the beast and his image, <clears throat> that is a picture of all of these um, different organizations that will all come together in the end of this world and they will be saying that the body of Christ is healed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, 
that will be a deception. It will be uh, because just for those those organizations to come together, uh, together with a Catholic church, that is not going to be a restored church and a church like the early church, and it's not going to accomplish the saving of a soul. Uh, it's not going to destroy sin. But there is a true church that, you know, re you read about it in the ninth chapter of Proverbs where it says wisdom has hewn out her seven pillars. <clears throat> That's God and Christ in a, in a fivefold ministry. Those are the pillars that, that, that holds the church uh, together and says that she has killed her beast. You know, that's the beast nature. We're all, we all have a beast nature. We all have a carnal nature. And we have got to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. And, and she has mingled her wine. That is, we have learned how to blend our spirit with the spirit of God. We've had to take on his spirit, his ways, um, and with one another. We're, we're going to have to learn how to live righteously with one another in peace. Uh, just like the, uh, the scripture says, how can you love God whom you have not seen if you love not your brother whom you have seen? I've been making a statement lately that fellowship, you know, we, we have to have fellowship with Jesus Christ, the Father, Jesus Christ. We have to have fellowship. The ministry has to be in fellowship with one another because we have to speak the same thing and we have to have the same mind. And the saints do too. The saints has to get that from the ministry fellowship or relationship with God and Christ and one another will produce trust. You, you don't really trust God until you really know him. You really don't have confidence in your brother, your sister, not unless you really get to know them in, in the fellowship of the spirit in the church. And that's going to produce unity. You know, Jesus prayed in St. John 17, Father, make them one even as you and I are one. And so, <clears throat> uh, and I think we can do a better job than we're doing right now if we won't murmur and complain and, and give over to disputings and labor and work uh, like we should, <clears throat> uh, having the right spirit, working in order and doing the right thing uh, without murmuring, without complaining, without disputings. I think we should be uh, uh, we should be uh, doing a better job in that than what we're doing. You, many people work on the negative side. We're going to have to learn to work on the positive side. Just get busy doing what is right, righteousness. Just get busy doing what the scriptures helps us to know to do. At first, <clears throat> you have to keep the flesh down. You got to push it back. Until this, this nature of Christ through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, until that becomes a part of our character, You'll have, to, you'll have to rule over the flesh. You'll have to mortify it. But once it's it, God's, you know, the Bible calls us God, his, the Lord's, for his workmanship. As he works his character in us, we don't have to, you know, at some point you're going to get to a point where you don't have to try to, to not give over to the flesh. The flesh won't have you any place. It won't be a part of your character anymore. Works of the flesh. 
So we just have to work on that while God's helping us to develop in this new nature or new creature, creation. Anyway, so uh, let me go on. Let me go back here now. I want to get back where I read this scripture to go. <clears throat> how did it say it? Uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations. So a lot of a lot of people take that that we we have to reach everybody in this world, and I'm promising you we don't. That's not what that means. It just means that we've got to reach everyone in the Gentile world that God is is reaching out to in this harvest. If we reached everyone in this world, there wouldn't be a thousand year millennial reign, but it's going to take another thousand year to reach all nations. There's nations that haven't even heard the name of Jesus. There's nations that don't even consider him. They're still worshiping false gods. And so... Uh, let me let me go through some of these scriptures to help you see uh, uh, the scriptures on on this. Uh, look in Psalms the ninety eighth chapter, <clears throat> the very first. Let me just start in the first verse, I believe. Um, Yes, let me just start in the first verse. It says, Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. For he hath done marvelous things. His right hand, that's the ministry, and his holy arm, that's Christ, hath gotten him the victory. This is talking about the early church. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He hath remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of the Lord. This is a this is a, a Psalms and a prophecy concerning the early church. And by the way, the scripture we read in Matthew 28, 19, it was talking to his 12 disciples. It's not talking to you and I. It was talking to them about going to all nations that they were connected to in the end of that world. Uh, Matthew 24, 14 says, Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. It's talking about back there before AD 70, that, 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 uh, gospel would be preached to that known world, those that God was dealing with, and before the end would come, that that harvest would take place. Uh, Romans ten eighteen, Paul declares, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world clearly that world, the Jewish world, that world was being harvested. Uh, so uh, then let's look at Colossians 1, 5 and 6. Colossians first chapter, verse 5 and 6. It says, the word of the truth of the gospel which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringing forth fruit. See, <clears throat> Paul was talking to the church at Colossae, the church at Colossae, Colossae, telling them that the word of truth, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. Talking about back there. In fact, you'll find that almost all scriptures talking about the end of the world are the the end or uh, the last time um, is talking about back there, the end of that world. Most, most scriptures are talking about that. There's very few scriptures that aren't. Then Colossians 1, 3 says, The gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, referring, it was referring to being preached by that ministry in the end of that world. Psalms 19, 1 through 6. This is a, 
a beautiful picture in the Psalms. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night uttereth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It's the heavens. This is talking about the churches and the ministry in the body of Christ back there in the early church. That was a prophecy in Psalms concerning that. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world, to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, S-U-N, that's really talking about Christ, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. This is the Psalm of David and the prophecy of the end of the Jewish world, how God would harvest that world by Jesus and his apostolic ministry. Um, I've got a note here. It says we're not going into all the world on our own, but only those but only those sent by the Lord to accomplish the judgment, harvesting the finished work of the Gentile world. The 1,000-year millennial will accomplish the remaining harvest along with the great white throne judgment following the 1,000 years. Um, let's see what 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So I just wanted to, I just thought it might be good if I just mentioned that, that uh, it's, in, it's, in, it's, I think it's in, uh, it's necessary for us to understand all these scriptures concerning the gospel that was preached to the whole world back there under the early church. That will happen again down here, but it won't encompass the whole globe of the earth. It will only encompass those that God's dealing with. God is dealing with the United States of America primarily where he's going to restore his church primarily and in the last several years, God has been adding other nations in. You know, I've been going now to the Dominican Republic for, it will be 20 years in February of next year that I've been going to the Dominican Republic. And we've got several great works over there. Just, you know, really uh, good men that have a good vision and understanding of this message and they can preach this message about as good as anybody else. You know, I mean, they're, they're great. They're good gifts. There's good teachers. They're good pastors. There's good prophets over there. There's good men of God over there that are carrying this gospel and this message to that nation. And, of course, you know, it was opened up in Haiti. That was the first missionary work that we had in the body. And uh, then, uh, of course, Brother brother. Uh, Jack Lewis took this message to Mexico, built a good, strong work over there after he, I think he was like 67 years old when he went over there and he didn't die until he was 90, I think he was 95 or up in his 90s. I'm not exact sure of the year, but um, before he turned it over to Brother John Bud, Johnny Bud, and of course we know we lost him uh, here uh, in, in September, it just don't seem like it's possible, but it is. I mean, we lost Brother Bud. Well, I guess I should say we didn't lose him. We haven't lost him. We'll see him again. But we've lost fellowship with him and, and his ministry for right now. And uh, so uh, we lost a great man. And... Uh, I'm certainly going to miss him. He was a dear, close, close friend of mine. But anyway, uh, God reached out and is still has a, a 
great work there in, in Mexico. And then uh, we, Brother Martin Baxter took this message to uh, the Philippines. Uh, his son, Brother Haven Baxter, worked with that at a time. And then finally, Brother John Peach and Sister Beverly took over that work and it saw, that, saw after it. And it's still a very uh, great work in the body of Christ. Uh, churches in Africa. We've got several men that have worked. Africa is a large continent. And we've got several churches over there. <clears throat> Brother uh, Goodwin's works over there. Uh, Brother Charlie Mays had works over in Africa. And uh, Brother Dykus has got a work over in Africa. And uh, I don't know, Brother uh, finnicum has got a work now in Honduras that he's working with. And and Brother, uh, Brother Wright and the Houston Church has been working the last few years in Cuba. And uh, we, need to, we need to keep praying for Cuba. There's a great interest in Cuba. And, and uh, I know Brother Wright's uh, sickness, his bout with, with his health has hindered him from being able to, and uh, with the cold, uh, coronavirus and uh, also they've had trouble with visas and things over there so we're praying for Cuba but I'm just mentioning these other countries God is restoring and been working on the United States of America for some time um, and uh, restoring his church that's why I've always said that the United States of America is not any greater nation than any other place on the face of the earth, except for the fact that God, God chose the United States of America to restore his church in. He sent our forefathers here. He helped our forefathers. He put it in their mind to develop a, a uh, democratic government. That's not God's, it's not God's government God's government's a theocratic government, but God gave us a temporary government of, of democracy so that there would be a separation of church and state and which would allow the church to be restored in the United States of America. And that's why our forefathers fled to this country to have freedom of religion. And even though America has, for the most part, forgot God, the Bible said the nation, when a nation forgets God, it's turned into hell. And this condition is certain, this nation is certainly in a hellish condition. We've got uh, just a few days until we'll, uh, the election uh, will take place for the United States president. And it's, it's a, the condition of our, uh, our government is, is a, it's in a dire condition. I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. And so I've never seen such a lack of respect and, I'm, and I've never seen government officials act the way that they're acting uh, and not having respect for their offices and, and for the men. It just shows that we've lost godliness. We've lost the fear of God. And so this nation is going to be, it'll be a short-lived. I do believe this is the nation that the Bible's talking about in the book of Revelation when it says that it will, uh, uh, it, it says it would be a sh short, let's see if I can get it to you right quick, I'm, I'm, that it would continue a short space. This you know, this nation will continue a short space after God restores his church. I think this nation will certainly fall as far as a superpower. Uh, I don't think this nation will be destroyed utterly, but I think it will fall. Uh, I don't see how 10 kings can come into power with the United States in the condition that it's in. And so we're, there's several things that, that's going to take place in the last prophetical hour after the uh, 
churches restored. And so we know that we're down in the end of the Gentile world and that we're not too far away from uh, the final. In fact, I think we are in the final generation uh, before many of these things will take place. And But there's many great things. Listen, don't begin, don't, Christians in the body of Christ shouldn't be looking gloomy about that. It's going to be the greatest time for the church that's ever existed since uh, the Gentiles, since the Lord turned to the Gentiles. The church fell away, it went into darkness. Uh, it first went into a Pentecostal type state, the Red Horse State, but then it went into darkness, a Black Horse State. And then uh, death was the rider of a pale horse. And uh, you know, and but in the Reformation, it came back to a dark black horse, a Protestant type era. And then the uh, red horse, the Pentecostal era. We've been in Pentecost in America since 1901 when it was first, uh, when God first poured out the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost in America. So we've been you know, a hundred and almost 120 years uh, in the Pentecostal movement. God, the heart of the Pentecostal movement was the, was the work that God gave Brother Souders to do to restore the body of Jesus Christ and the message of the body of Christ and the message of the restored church. We're still in that. We're still working in that restoring the church. I should say the Lord's restoring the church. We're his laborers uh, together with him, but he's the one that's doing the work. He's doing it through us, through his ministry, through his people. Anyway, so the greatest move of God that this uh, United States and these nations that I, minister, that I mentioned, the greatest move of God is yet to take place. Uh, the greatest operation, the greatest manifestation of the power uh, and demonstration of the Spirit is yet to be seen. What we read about in the New Testament, somebody asked me recently, said, what are we lacking, Brother Smith, from having all that we need? I said, we're lacking what the early church had, the power and demonstration of the Spirit and an apostolic ministry, that apostolic order that, uh, you know, God will bring us into unity with all of that. We're, and we may be about as far as we can go without it. God's gonna move. I think right now this nation is in the midst of uh, uh, a major change as far as the world is. God's getting the world ready for judgment. What we've preached about for many, many years about the, the people, God's people, come out of her, my people. God's gonna gather his people out of this uh, conglomeration of Christian religion into one body. He's gonna put us together, gather our brothers and sisters in here together and we're trying to get ready for that in the body of Christ because it's going to take a lot of work. And before God judges that system, he will judge it, but he won't judge it. He will not uh, judge that system, not until he gathers all of the people that he can get. He'll save everything that can be saved uh, out of Babylon. And so a great influx is coming into the body of Christ and a great operation of and manifestation of the power of God and manifestation of his spirit, just like you read about in the early church, that's going to, it's going to accomplish making up the remainder of the bride of Jesus Christ that will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So uh, the best is yet to come. We sing that song. Uh, and so hold your head up high. 
look up to the hills from whence cometh your help. Your help comes from the Lord. Uh, and so uh, I'm a, I am, I'm, it, at times God lets me feel, you know, and I'm sure he does you too at times when that, the richness of the spirit of God comes in among us and, and blesses us and uh, we can we we can feel the urgency of the coming of the Lord. You know, I think it's important to understand that the Lord is coming. He's not coming to catch his people away like we've been taught in the past, but he's coming first. He's coming in the church in power and demonstration and to bring his fullness that's going to bring what is lacking among us where I think we are close to it. I think, you know, I've been saying this in the, in the tabernacle. If you take that type, the gate of the tabernacle, that is the gate of faith. You get in through faith and you, then uh, the brazen altar, that's our, that's where our sacrifice is uh, offered up. The, the the priest takes the blood of the sacrifice and goes to the holy uh, I mean to the laver and washes himself and that's a picture of us being washed by the water of the word the spirit of God's word the anointing the the that God input that uh, changes us and makes us like him what John said when he appeared, it says, brethren, we are the sons of God. And he said, uh, how, how does he say that? Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we are called the sons of God. And he said, and we know not what we shall be, but when he appeared, we shall be like him. I don't think that's talking about, you know, if Jesus appeared today like he appeared to some in the early church, and I think he will again down here in the restored church, but for him to, I, I don't think that's talking about physically appearing. That's not going to change you to be like him. What's going to change you is when he comes in your life in such a way that you change, your life change, and you become like him. See, and that's the coming of the Lord. It, it takes time. It's a process. It's a harvest, God. And so I think, you know, the Lord is going to, he's going to come first. He's going to come in the church. And he's going to come to the church and then in the church. And then he'll come for the the bride, the, the church, the bride members. And so it's a process. It took a 45 year period from the day of Pentecost to AD 70 to accomplish making up that portion of the bride. Uh, it won't take that long down here. We've got a lot more uh, ability. We've got a lot more faster transportation. We've got more technology. Uh, you know, Paul had to ride a donkey <laughs> or take a boat or walk to go and develop the works he developed. You know, we can take an airplane. We can be, you know, we can do it uh, over the internet, much of it. We can do teaching. It's like right now. I don't have to come into your, I'm in your home right now. I don't have to come see you. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's new methods that God is giving uh, making available to the church. And uh, so God will help us to use those things. Uh, anyway, the Lord is coming and and it's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious when God, God will take us through many things. But just remember this, in the type of Elijah up on Mount Horeb, and that is a picture of the end of this world. It's a type. Remember, the, rock, the wind blew against the mountain, this mountain of religion. Uh, 
this mountain of, of God that the, that, uh, the winds, uh, remember the four angels are holding back the four winds, but they're going to blow in the end of this world. Uh, in that last prophetical hour, they're going to blow against the mountain and it's going to break the rice, it's going to break up everything. And then an earthquake that's going to shake the world. And then a fire of judgment come against the mountain. But remember, Elijah was in the cave in the top of the mountain. None of that affected him. Those things were not for Elijah. But after those things, he heard a still, small voice. Remember, Jesus said, My sheep know my voice, and another they will not hear. Oh God, that's my desire tonight. God, let me let me get close enough to you that I know your voice and it never will compare to anything else. You know, I mean, have you ever have you ever wondered, is this God talking to me or is this the devil talking? <laughs> well, don't you want to get to a place where you know the voice of God? And uh, so and uh, Jesus said, you know, he was talking back there in the end of that world, but he said another, there, another sheep. Uh, he was talking about the Gentile world, that there was another, there was other sheep that he, he still needed to uh, uh, reconcile back to his father. And so here we are down here in the end, 2000 uh, and 20, almost 2021. And if that was AD 33, well, uh, back there, then we're only, what, 12 years away from a 2000 year world. We're nearing the coming of the Lord. And, uh, the last prophetical hour. So I think we we need to we need to uh, be excited about what God's doing. I'm not worried about the winds that are blowing or the or the shakings that may be going to take place. Uh, it's in prophecy. We know that the world's going to be in a uh, condition, or will be persecution, or will be trials but there's a God in heaven that's gonna make up the difference for every bit of that. And God's gonna bless his people. Remember, there was light down in Goshen, in Egypt, when there was a, a famine, the people were starving to death, but God took care of his people. And God will take care of you. He'll take care of his people. And so, uh, hold on to the Lord. Don't lose face. We're, we're lit. We, we, there's an old song that says, I've gone too far to turn back now. <laughs> you, you, you can't get discouraged right now. Right now is nearing a great time for the people of God and an exciting time that's, that's coming up. I just somehow or another, I have that feeling of what Jesus said, you know, just I'm just borrowing a little bit of that feeling back there when he said, uh, say not it's four months to the harvest for the fields are white and ready to harvest. I believe that. I, be, I believe people are hungry for God. I think people, many people are hungry. They don't know what they're hungry for. But when they feel God's spirit, when God begins to touch them and deal with them, I, I believe that they will respond because this world is, doesn't satisfy. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only he can uh, make you whole. Uh, the world, that song says, the world will try to satisfy that longing in your soul. But only Jesus can satisfy and there's so much truth to that so reach out to him I've been telling the people in in the Little Rock Church let's let's give him a little extra time right now let's let's give him a little more time in prayer 
Let's try to develop our relationship with him. As I was saying earlier, fellowship, it will, it will produce trust in the Lord. You know, we're, our, we're, we're, we need to put our confidence, our hope and trust is in the Lord. Our confidence is in man. But I, I believe that God's going to have a ministry you can absolutely have confidence in. He is a trustworthy Savior. And if we will work on our relationship with him, it will it will end with us. That scripture I used in, in Proverbs 9, uh, wisdom, she's hewn out her seven pillars. She's um, uh, 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 what does it say about her pillars? She's hewn out her seven pillars. She's uh, killed her beast. She's mingled her wine. I, I'm wanting to mingle my wine more with my Savior. I'm wanting to get my spirit blended with his. I don't want his coming down and, and my spirit to pollute his. I'd like to get my spirit in such a way. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. See, I'd like to get my spirit poor enough that I can blend and, and mingle it with God's spirit and that I could get more of his spirit blended in with mine. Oh, God. Uh, and we sing that song, and there's no him, more of him. Precious song. Uh, we all could use a little more of him, that's for sure. Anyway, God bless your hearts. I appreciate all of you. appreciate you for listening to me. Uh, I may just uh, cut it a little bit short tonight. But I do appreciate, I see many, many of you, uh, Sister Calderon, I see you're on there from the Dominican Republic, uh, Brother uh, Calderon's son and daughter-in-law, Josecito and Denise was on from St. Martin a little while ago, I saw them on, there's just so many of you uh, that, that uh, have been on. Sister Alba, good to see her on here. Anyway, all of you, there's just so many of you. God bless your hearts. Uh, I love this word. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I love his people. Uh, pray for me, and I'll pray for you. And hold your head up. Lift up your hands and strengthen your feeble knees. <laughs> Uh, there's a glorious Savior that uh, loves you and cares more for you than any, anybody in this world cares. And he will never leave you and he'll never forsake you. He's a friend that's greater than a brother. God bless your hearts. Um, yes, we're coming. We're kind of coming to Brownsville soon. We're looking forward to it, Brother Bates. God bless your hearts. Y'all have a good night. I'll see you uh, Sunday, the Saints, and uh, here in Little Rock. Bring a friend. Tell somebody about Jesus and uh, invite them to church. I think it's a time right now that People will consider God more than they have in the past. People that aren't maybe going to church or they're hungry for, hungry for maybe a little bit more. Uh, so don't, don't, don't put a bushel over your, your candle, you know, over your light. Let your light shine. And uh, let the people of God know that there's a Savior that's working in your life that you'd like to see them be a part of. All right. Good night. God bless you all.